In this episode, I share a webinar that I did for malesurvivor.org in its entirety. It goes into the political theory, trauma, therapy, and a lot more. My name is Justin Sinceri. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. I think the world needs a new paradigm for mental health. Welcome to Stuck Not Broken. Before I get into things, as always, please put yourself first. I do keep every episode as safe as I can, but just by the nature of the topics, you may experience some stuff come up, so take a break if you need to. This one in particular touches upon some difficult topics, but it doesn't go into details as usual. This podcast is not therapy, nor is it intended to be a replacement for therapy. So this is a webinar from malesurvivor.org. Malesurvivor.org is a nonprofit resource for men to find support, find information, and find hope as well. I've uh, been to the website, spent some time there, checked out the forums. It's pretty amazing. The forum is robust to say the least. They have webinars. People are sharing their personal stories, which I thought was pretty amazing. So there's really this like, not just this collection of resources and information, but also genuine support malesurvivor.org. I highly recommend that. Otherwise, here is the entire presentation. I hope you benefit from it. Good evening to um, all of our attendees in the US and abroad around the globe for tonight's webinar with Justin Sinceri, licensed marriage and family therapist, host of the excellent polyvagal podcast, Stuck Not Broken, and self-proclaimed trauma nerd. Justin, thank you, and how are you this evening? I'm doing really well. Thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this. Well, we are excited to have you. Our program uh, this evening is titled From Dissociation and Flight Fight to Safe and Social. Most people would not recognize the terms polyvagal theory, but it has been discussed in Male Survivor Support Forum dating back to 2016. Learning about the polyvagal states has resonated with me and other forum members because it is body focused. It's a process ongoing in my body, in our bodies constantly. So Justin, why is that? And why, what are the unique challenges for survivors of sexual abuse? In the trauma realm, we hear things like freeze, flight, fight. We hear about fawn. We hear about all these things that usually start with an F. And, but they're just these words that kind of float out there and don't really have a foundation in anything besides like maybe behavioral sets or how we loosely respond to what we call trauma. But it's all these sort of loose floating concepts. And political theory um, takes these concepts and gives them a biological foundation in the autonomic nervous system. And rather than it being, well, this is how I responded to whatever, now it's my nervous, my autonomic nervous system in particular responded this way. And it's not because I'm defective. It's not because I was born broken or something like that. It's uh, because I'm a mammal and mammals tend to respond in this sequence of events or autonomic shifts in more or less predictive ways. Um, so it, it's a lot more normalizing, I think, rather than it being, well, this is how I responded and I don't know why. And it's just this sort of response. It's, well, here's your nervous system. Here's the autonomic ladder, the polyvagal ladder, and here's the sequence of events you went through. Uh, so it's it's a lot more normalizing, I would say, and it's grounded in biology versus just behavioral concepts or psychological constructs. And so, with some guidance, and for me, uh, the, one of the greatest sources of that guidance has been your uh, podcast, "Stuck Not Broken." Um, I've learned it's possible to monitor my state and regulate or co-regulate to a, a safe and social state of awareness. I've learned more about why physical intimacy is at times triggering, why physical closeness sometimes feel uncomfortable and sometimes it feels comfortable and fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Polyvagal theory helps provide some of those answers. And we're hoping, Justin, that you could help us gain some traction with the issues that are um, unique to being a sexual abuse survivor? Well, I think we first have to understand what the polyvagal theory is and the different states. Is it kind of okay if we go into that? Sure. Just before we do, I just want to mention to our attendees, you have a set of user controls at the bottom of your um, screen that allow you to raise your hand to respond to a few polls that we have ready tonight. 
uh, to type questions to Justin and our other panelist, a fellow male survivor board member, Nathan Lachine. How about everybody a hand wave to Nathan? Hey, there we go, super. Um, and also Justin, I know in your podcast, I always love hearing your keep yourself safe message. Yeah. Can you lay that on us for a moment? Yeah, this stuff is potentially very triggering. I think it's very normalizing and validating, but at the same time, even though I have no plans to go into, and I never do on the podcast or in presentations, I don't ever go into like details of events that have left people in a traumatized state. But still, like just by the nature of what we talk about, there's a pretty good chance that stuff's going to come up for people. They're going to have some sort of reaction to it. And so I just really encourage people to put yourself first, take a break if you need to, drink some water if you need to, um, play with a fidget, squeeze your palm, whatever you got to do, like keep yourself in a well-regulated place as much as you can. And this is recorded. So if you got to like shut it down, shut it down. You know what I mean? So yeah, that's what I mean by put yourself first. Uh, I love it. And so if you need to check out because you're putting yourself first, then don't worry. It'll be here in a couple of days for everybody to take a listen. So um, back to our program, uh, Justin, um, help us gain some traction in this. We know we probably understand dissociation or fight flight or freeze, but what don't we know? I, I think that well, what people commonly don't know is that it's not simply, it's not a choice that people make to go into these different uh, physiological state shifts. It's not a choice. No one is consciously choosing to do these things. It's a it's an issue of the autonomic nervous system. This is stuff that is, it's like uh, it's brainstem stuff. It's hardwired into our DNA to respond to certain cues in certain ways. So that, that's the basic idea of political theory. Is it's really more about uh, it's the science of connection. It's the science of how human beings or mammals in general connect, but also how we respond to danger. And there are ways that you know, like that we are more predictably going to respond to danger. Like if my eyes go wide and I have a flat affect. You know, you might feel like this pull of like being pulled back. Your nervous system, you don't choose to like pull back and say like, whoa, Justin's acting kind of funny right now. You don't, that's not a choice. It's your, your nervous system detects me acting in a different way and then it pulls back. So this is all autonomic, but no, none of this is chosen. And the political theory lays out that these aren't behavioral choices or psychological constructs, that this is anatomy. And we have these different autonomic states, three primary ones and three mixed states that every single one of us shares, every single one of us feels throughout the day, off and on. Right. And now I'm so, sharing I'm sharing that uh, primary mixed states uh, graphic now that is from your website, justinlmft.com in the yeah. file share section. Yeah. So this is a metaphor from Deb Dana uh, and Dr. Porges. He created the political theory or I guess created is the right word. Uh, but he laid out the three primary states, which is the safe and social. It's one of the parasympathetic systems. There's two of them. Uh, then the flight fight sympathetic system. That's that's one state with two different sort of behaviors to them. And then the dorsal vagal shutdown system, which is another parasympathetic system. There's actually two. So he laid out here. Here's my theory, political theory that the vagus nerve has two different parasympathetic uses. We also have the sympathetic system. And Deb Dana took that and created it into this metaphor of a ladder, which really aligns with the way the biology is made up in our system, but also how we utilize the biology. So ideally we want to exist in our safe and social state. We want to be at the top of our polyvagal ladder, utilizing the ventral vagal parasympathetic system. We want to exist there. We want to be able to connect to others, feel safe, feel connected, make eye contact and smile and be close and hug be physically intimate. We want to be able to do all those things. But throughout life, whether it's through some extreme situation or even like a benign one, like something went wrong at work, we shift out of our pathways, our ventral vagal pathways that are responsible for feeling safe and feeling connected. We lose access to those pathways. They actually more or less turn off. We'll call it, we'll say it like that. And we drop down the polyvagal ladder into the flight fight sympathetic system. And in that state, we become mobilized. We are we are now in a state of, of needing. Our body has, is now prepared to run away, and if that doesn't work, then the body is prepared to fight. And it's specifically in that order. If we can't be safe, 
we drop down the ladder into our flight system or flight fight system. But first the flight, if we can't run away or we perceive we can't run away, then we drop further down the ladder into our fight system. And this is designed to still get to safety. If we can run away, get to safety, we're, we're all set. But if we can't run away, we can use our aggression to push or throw or lift or whatever it is, the, the predator, and then use our, our flight system to get to safety back to our families, back to our herd or tribe, whatever it is. If we can't run away, we can't fight, we drop all the way down the polyvagal ladder into the dorsal vagal shutdown state. And this is different than freeze. A lot of people use the word freeze, but in the polyvagal theory, these are two separate concepts. In the dorsal vagal shutdown state, we, it's a limb collapse. We immobilize, but we collapse. Um, it's kind of like death fainting, playing dead, fainting. Uh, that's where the whole the entire body is now shutting down in preparation because it perceives or it detects that it's going to die. So it's preparing to die. And so it kind of goes numb. We dissociate. You mentioned dissociation. Part of the shutdown system is that we dissociate. We go numb. Everything in our system slows down. Our heartbeat slows down. Blood pressure slows down. Everything slows down. Even our, our the blood to the brain slows down. So we have less conscious uh, capacity. And that dissociation might be linked to the blood flow to the brain being slowed down. So those are the primary states of polyvagal theory. If we can't be safe, we drop down all the way to shut down if needed. But it's a ladder, so we can't just bump right back up to the safe and social state. We actually have to climb up the polyvagal ladder from shutdown into fight. And in therapy, when I work with clients that have or are that we diagnose maybe with depression, from the polyvagal theory paradigm, it's we can call it shutdown, dorsal vagal shutdown. They're kind of stuck in this state, and it looks like depression. But coming out of depression, you don't just feel safe and connected, and you're ready to roll and be motivated to conquer whatever's in your day, right? You actually have to come out of that into this like fight state, and we want it to feel like this sympathetic power, the surge. But honestly, a lot of times it feels like anger and aggression, irritability. And it's, but that's, that's kind of, it's in a, in a way normal, but point being, we have to climb up the polyvagal ladder into that fight energy and then into that anxious flight energy. And then finally up into our safe and social state and reconnect with others. We can't skip states. Exactly. We go up and down in, in a sequence. So if not just us, but mammals, if a survivor is, is working with a therapist who's polyvagal informed, then the process is going to resemble how to identify the cues to what state you're in. Um, yeah. Like for me, I, I feel like uh, my home away from home is in the uh, fight um, state. Irritable, yeah. um, lots of energy. Yeah, so a therapist who's polyvagal, polyvagal theory is not a modality. It's, it's uh, just the science underneath human connection and how we respond to danger. So someone who's what we call political informed is going to be able to work with that client to identify their home away from home, which is where they spend more time out of the safe and social state. That's one thing, but also to recognize when they're going up and down the ladder or what brings them. What I focus on a lot is what brings you to safety? What helps you to actually feel safe? And because we have to build that capacity, capacity to feel safe. That's absolutely essential to, to treatment is feeling safe and being able to tolerate the discomfort that comes along with, climbing the polyvagal ladder because it's a very uncomfortable thing, very vulnerable, where you feel very exposed. So it's, it's difficult. Uh, so yeah, someone who's polyvagal informed will, will help to identify home away from home, identify what feels safe for you. But also in session, you'll be able to recognize where the client is at in that moment. So when I see a client that is wide-eyed, flat affect, I know they don't have access to their safety state because if they did, they'd be smiling and squinting their eyes They'd have use of their eyebrow, eyebrow muscle, whatever those are, those muscles. <laughs> They'd be able to move their eyebrows. Um, they'd have eye crinkles when they smile or when they're listening. Those would all be indications that those biological pathways are active, that their safety state is active. If they're not doing that, that means they're in some sort of defensive state. And if they're more energized and mobile and leaning forward, talking faster, taking shorter breaths, that tells me they're in a flight fight state. If they're slouched and collapsed and like, I call it being in a puddle, a lot of my clients just look like they're just in a puddle and that's more of that shutdown state. Uh, we have our first question from Richard. And uh, as a reminder to our attendees that down at the bottom, you have a Q and A 
uh, button in your control panel for you to alert us to your question. Uh, I know some people like to put it into chat, but uh, the panelists are looking for it in the Q&A. So our first question for Richard is, for those of us new to vagal, what is polyvagal? Is this a response to trauma, stress, violence, et cetera? No, the, the vagus nerve is a nerve that connects the brainstem to pretty much the rest of the body. The vagus nerve is the nerve that the parasympathetic nervous system utilizes to repurpose our organs, muscles for whatever state we need to be. And that's my basic understanding of it. So mm -hmm. the vagus nerve is actually not the most important part because as Dr. Portis calls it, um, the vagus nerve is a conduit. It sends messages. It's, it's not the thing in and of itself that needs to be stimulated or hacked. We're not, that's not the point. The point is what communication is our brainstem sending to the rest of our body? And what is the communication that our body is sending back up to our brainstem? So it's a feedback, it's a feedback loop. And this is, I had talked to Dr. Portis or interviewed him and he, that's kind of what he said was it, the feedback loop is what's important not the nerve itself. The nerve is just, it's kind of like conduit. A, um, a conduit. Th yeah. It's right. yeah. It's a highway. Like the messages. Right. Okay. Yeah. That episode of your podcast was absolutely um, fantastic. Oh, cool. And, like um, and I personally listened to it two or three times to <laughs> capture the, the small essences that were in it. Um, just absolutely there. fast. Yeah. yeah, absolutely fascinating. So um, again, I highly recommend to our listeners uh, the, the Stuck Not Broken podcast that that Justin offers. Justin, when how did you do you remember the first introduction you had to polyvagal theory? Yeah, yeah, I was working. Well, I still am. I work for a public school district. I work teenagers. And in the summers, we have we can meet with our students. They typically want nothing to do with school or school school personnel. So uh, usually they elect not to do therapy in the summer. So we have a lot of time for program development, curriculum development, uh, presentations, uh, professional development, stuff like that. So one summer I was I had been working with a student who was heavily heavily traumatized, and was just uh, that was just just starting to come out. But I was at a like a dead end or a roadblock and i was like this isn't i'm not being helpful i didn't feel like i was being helpful i feel like there's something i'm missing here trauma obviously has a lot to do with this but in school we don't learn about political theory we don't learn they, they teach us that trauma has something to do it lives in the body it has something to do with the body never explain what the hell that means and so one summer i'm like i'm gonna figure this out and i'm just gonna assume i know nothing start learning about trauma all over again so i of course went to youtube and typed in trauma and I'm like, let's just see what comes up. Mm -hmm. And eventually I stumbled upon Peter Levine. He created somatic experiencing um, and his body mind approach, this whole body approach was, I thought was nonsense at first, but intriguing. So I kind of kept with it, just assuming I know nothing. And then from that, that, that eventually led me down to the YouTube rabbit hole to Dr. Porter just doing a lecture and things just started connecting and coming together for me. Um, and for me, the, uh, my introduction was through Brian Finnerty, who is um, of Welcome Connections in New Jersey. And he mentioned polyvagal theory in the States to me uh, recently, and also your podcast. And, um, you know, I felt like it, it just changed the trajectory of my recovery. Because I mm. always, I, I, through, you know, off and on therapy over the decades, I just felt like the missing piece was explaining how my body felt. Right. But why my body felt differently on different occasions to the same environment, whether mm. that's at work or at home or in my relationships. And like sometimes my reaction would be because I wasn't safe and social. And, yeah. uh, and then versus my reaction would be volatile if I was down the ladder. So I'm hoping that this resonates for survivors, which is 74% of the uh, panelists, or excuse me, attendees as polled, uh, followed by uh, therapists, 23%, uh, and then partners, spouses, friends, and family of survivors, agency faith, and other organizations, education professionals, and the other category. So thanks for um, 
giving us that heads up. Um, we have a couple more questions that have uh, been submitted. Stephen asked, how do you mean the terms ventral and dorsal? Those are the specific uh, parts of the brainstem that the, um, the vagus nerve is not just one nerve. It actually has different pieces of the brainstem that connect to it. So dorsal and ventral are just the different areas. The ventral comes from nucleus ambiguous. Like it gets way, way detailed. And at some point in my research, I was like, I, I can't take on all this. So I'll just stop at this point. So, but I've actually gone to his book to learn more about this, but uh, it's just it's different areas of the brainstem. So dorsal vagal and ventral vagal, they're just two different sources of um, brainstem that connect to the vagus that then connect to the rest of the body. That's all it means. Right. And there's, there's two questions uh, might be related, so I'm going to I'm going to mention them both. Um, Mark asks, have you had any experience with devices that stimulate the vagus nerve? They are said to help reduce reactivity. And does EMDR therapy regulate right, right and left brain? I don't know enough about EMDR therapy. That's one of the theories of how it can be helpful. Um, I, I, don't, I don't. I can't really go much deeper into that. So it, it seems to be helpful, but is that because of eye movements, or is that because of it provides the same things that all other therapy modalities do? Co-regulation, taking the person seriously, empathy, warmth, all of those pieces are in EMDR. I don't know, and I've seen a couple studies that say that eye movements aren't really part of how it helps. So I don't know, but I've also seen Peter Levine, the creator of Somatic Experiencing. He did some of that stuff during a live session that he had recorded. So I don't, I don't know if that's why it helps, honestly. When it comes to the devices, I had asked Dr. Portis that because it's a really good question because you see whoever talking about stimulating the vagus nerve, hacking the vagus nerve. And I was like, I just had my doubts up about, it seems kind of huckstery in my opinion. And so I asked Dr. Portis, what, you know, what is there to this? And his response was basically, yeah, you can stimulate it, but you may have all these other unintended consequences because the vagus nerve, uh, it, it connects to a whole bunch of stuff. So if you stimulate it to relieve one symptom, you may end up giving yourself diarrhea because you've created some other unintended consequence. That, I think that's kind of what he had said to me was like, you, you want this, but it controls a whole bunch of other stuff. So you never know what the unintended consequence is going to be. So the, the point is not to stimulate the vagus nerve, in my opinion. As a therapist, I don't know. I, I'm not doing that. I'm helping people feel safe and to build the capacity to feel safe by, you know, uh, and the, the, the lens is that we're activating your ventral vagal parasympathetic system, but feeling safe, the experience of feeling safe, that's what's important. Whether or not we're hacking or stimulating, we're losing the point. Like if, if you become focused on what to do to hack the system, you're going to lose the totality of experience. There's a lot more going on than just you know, splashing cold water in your face, hoping to activate or trigger something. Like, what does it actually feel like in your body to do, to go through that motion and to actually feel the sensations of what you just did? Does that make sense? Like, there's a difference there. If, you're, if the mindset is to hack something, you're going to lose the experience of the thing that you're trying to do, I, I think. Um, okay. I put up the uh, ladder graphic again because we have a couple different ladder questions. Scott asks, are the steps of the ladder definitive? Can one go from social to shut down just because one has grown tired of fighting? I, I wouldn't call it grown tired of because that's a story. That's another concept, story follows state. And whatever state we're in has stories that come into our mind that we don't control, we don't ask for, we don't choose. So if someone who's in a, for someone to say, I'm tired of being in the state, I'm worn out, to me that already sounds like some shutdown flavor to it. Like the energy is kind of sucked out of them. So they've probably already gone from that fight, energize, I'm in a kick-ass kind of state. I'm not taking any more of this. I'm going to fight my whatever it is. They've already gone from that into shutdown. And now their story is, I'm drained. I'm too tired. I can't do this anymore. So the, to me, that would indicate they're already in their shutdown state. So that, that's a story, though. So when we shift states, we're trying to explain why. Our, our mind attempts to explain why. It'll come up with images or metaphors. It'll come up with textures or colors that match what we're going through inside. Usually as human beings, we just tend to focus on the cognitive 
word-based stories like I'm tired, I'm drained, I can't do this anymore. Those are explanations for why our sh our state just shifted. That's how I would interpret that. I seem to recall the question was about self-medicating and um, uh, is it an attempt to uh, work through the states? I think so. It's called the behavioral adaptation, uh, another political concept that whatever state we get stuck, because we, we can get stuck in these states. That's what trauma is, is being stuck in a defensive state. Trauma is not the thing you went through. Trauma is how that thing impacted you or the lack of things. Like if you didn't get enough uh, safety or safe enough parenting growing up, that would leave you in a defensive state. Likewise, if you survived a thing like a sexual assault, that would leave you in a certain, that could potentially leave you in a certain state. So trauma is not the thing you went through. Trauma is the state that you're left in, the defensive state. It's, it's being stuck in a defensive state. So yeah, substance abuse could be some a way that somebody copes, the way, the way that they will self-medicate, the way they cope, but we call it a behavioral adaptation. That might be their way of, I think, climbing their ladder, or at least it's more like a foe climbing a ladder. Like you're not actually uh, activating your safe and social system, I don't think, but or, or if you are, it's kind of it's kind of like a hack in a way. So it's not, are you truly building your capacity to feel safe, feel connected? I, I would say probably not, but I, it is a behavioral, it's like a way to cope with the pain of being in a stuck defensive state is how I understand it. Well, at the very least, it's an attempt to numb out. Oh yeah, it's I think relief. Relief is a pretty big, and I've, I've worked in substance abuse a lot, and relief over and over again is, a, is something that people say they get out of it. Like I don't have to feel whatever it is, rather than I, I get to feel whatever. It's more like I don't have to feel these other things. But for some, they find that uh, in building safety anchors, let's say that um, that uh, listening to music or gardening yeah. are other uh, healthy uh, behaviors. Absolutely, and those can be done what well, I mean anything can be done like anything I think could be a behavioral adaptation where we're just sort of compulsively doing it and even for myself I, I, my home away from home is more of a shutdown state and my whole life and coming out of that I feel this sort of sympathetic dry right and now I've used that rather than like listening to it feeling it and letting it do its thing I'll go like crazy on like creating content I'll go on this blitzkrieg of like recording stuff and writing stuff and like that, because I'm not listening to it I'm not feeling it and so rather than feeling it and being with it and meditating on it, maybe or journaling around it and really being with it, it kind of consumes me. And then it comes through in this other avenue, which is not, it's very productive. I can be very productive in the state, but it's not exactly productive in helping me actually climb my political ladder. So anything can be a behavioral adaptation. For me, that, that was a way that I can cope with my sympathetic state returning. Uh, but other things are ways that we can listen to and be with that energy. So if we're doing like yoga, yoga is a way that someone can come out of shutdown, feel some sympathetic return in a safe environment with safe people. They have structure, they have guidance, they have co-regulation, they have smiles from people, they can feel their muscles. So that's a really good way. Meditation can be a way to feel these things. Gardening easily fits into that. Trimming my, my road, I used to do a lot of trimming of my road bush, rose bushes in the back. And there's something just kind of peaceful about it. You just, you get in the moment, you tap into your, your five senses and you just be, and whatever feelings you have are, are okay. That's a heck of a lot different than me frantically doing something as a way to cope with how I feel. You know, one of the things that I got in the habit of doing when I was listening to Stuck Not Broken was that it made me think about what is it about some of my favorite activities that mm. I like? And yeah. it's the touching it's the sensation, it's the grounding yeah. in the here and the now. And I didn't really put all that together until I was forced to examine it. It's amazing. Yeah, no, that's beautiful because you, all of us are pulled in some direction. Usually they can be called hobbies, they can be called passions, or maybe there's just something inside of us that we haven't really nurtured. And it just like, like my mom was, she's a wonderful artist. She can sketch, I mean, just so good. But she kind of let that skill and that passion taper off. So it's still within her. And I remember as a kid, like seeing her beautiful drawings in her sketchbook and be like, why aren't you doing this? You know, and she's like, well, I had kids. <laughs> it's not really an option anymore. But we all have these things inside of us that we're pulled towards. And if we can listen to them and be with those pulls, 
there's little clues in there as to like why or what about those things for our nervous system in particular feel right, feel good, or help us climb our political ladder. I love drawing personally. I love to draw. My whole life I've been an artist. I've been drawing. But when you, I didn't really notice that I really just like, I like the, the touch of the paper, especially like the brown toned paper, tan toned paper. I like the way the markers glide across that paper. I like the way the colored pencil just sits on the paper. Like there's, all, there's experiences within my hobby that I'm pulled toward. And something about those when I'm with them, I just feel lighter. My breathing becomes easier, easier. I feel more grounded in my body in the present moment. I'm more likely to be able to socially engage with people. So there's, there's, there's things, these, these hobbies or these passions or these things that we're curious about, it's there for a reason. It speaks to our system, I think, and can actually help our, us climb our ladder. Right, right. So Nathan, you, you're absolutely right. Some of these questions, uh, well, the questions have been amazing. And Nathan, uh, what does this bring up for you as you listen to this um, program this evening? You know, as a survivor, uh, as somebody who has had an introduction to polyvagal theory through listening to me or through some of our meetings, but what does this bring up for you? It definitely brings up just how incredible our body is at protecting itself. And I think that's something that we really discount and that self-protection that, uh, you know, that disassociation is so common for survivors. And, you know, the body is just trying to protect itself. And how do we then reconnect? How do we go back up our polyvagal ladder and, you know, get back into our higher functioning? Incredible. Um, thank you, Nathan. Um, other questions that are coming in. Fantastic question. Here's one from Sean. How does polyvagal relate to sleep issues that survivors deal with? Uh, one of, well, it could go a couple of different routes. One of them is if somebody's in a stuck shutdown state, that in that state, energy is just like you don't have the energy for life, right? It's just sucked out of you. And oversleeping could be pretty darn common for that state. Likewise, if someone's in more of a stuck flight fight state and then they go to bed, it's really hard to immobilize when you're in a flight fight state because when you go to bed, that's what you're doing. You're immobilizing. It makes so much sense. I just can't believe this has. <laughs> it does where, I know? Where has this been? I know. I know. For all these decades. I'm with you. So yeah, if you look yeah. at the ladder, I have in the bold capitals. They have that's the primary states: safe and social, flight, fight, shutdown. Three primary states. When and, and these relate to specific biological pathways. When you have those, when you 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 can mix these primary states to create mixed states, just like you can mix primary colors to make mixed colors. You, you can mix red and blue to make purple, right? Uh, yellow and blue make green. You get the idea? So mm -hmm. in, in the pink words, play, stillness, and freeze, those are our mixed states. Now, when we lay down to go to bed or go to yoga or do uh, meditation, we need to be able to immobilize while being safe. So that's shutting down, that's the shutdown state plus the safe and social state. We have to have those two states active in order to utilize something called stillness. So we're immobilizing while safe. It says shutdown, but really what it means is immobilization. It says flight fight, but it really means mobilization. And safe and social really means social connection and social engagement. So that's a mixed state. If we can't have access to our safety state, then we, it's really hard to immobilize or to be still. It's, it's really hard to yeah immobilize and to utilize stillness, just like kids in school that have a hard time sitting still for whatever reason. They don't have access to their safety state in order to immobilize while safe. So for survivors uh, laying down to go to sleep, it could be a big challenge because in your nervous system, you may not your nervous system is not detecting safety and that could be due to all kinds of stuff time of day the fact that it's dark sounds outside i mean whatever triggers potentially in your environment are reminiscent of the events that someone survived that could be why but it could also just be in general someone exists in a chronic flight fight state or even a chronic freeze state and they're just sort of always on edge and slowing down and immobilizing and feeling feeling safe are huge challenges for them. So yes, falling to sleep is going to be very difficult. 
Mark's asking, can I do something on my own to enhance health in my polyvagal ladder, say medication or exercise or yoga, or do I need a therapist to really heal, to get a lasting effect? Do you, wants- need a ther- do you need a therapist? I would say no, but at some point it can be helpful. I, I believe you know there is some level of self-healing we can do. I don't discount that. I was on that path. But I got to a point where I'm like, I, I just need some like that extra push from someone who's been there before. So I hired a coach. I didn't go to a therapist. That's fine. I just wanted someone that was well-versed in this and the body aspects of healing and, and climbing our ladder and whatnot. So I hired a coach. She was phenomenal. And she was able to provide things that I just couldn't do on my own. So there is a place for it. Does everyone need it? I, 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 don't, I wouldn't say 100% yeah. But yeah, there's, there's definitely things that we can do just on our own. And one of the easiest ways is just like, what do you enjoy? Like we talked about earlier, what do you enjoy? And while you're enjoying it, notice what, what, like what feels good. The next time you're drawing or gardening or riding a bike or going for a walk, you have to actually experience it and, and let yourself smile. Like as you're noticing you feel safe, let that smile come because you're going to feel weird. It's going to feel uncomfortable. Let it happen. And let yourself feel safe. Like when you smile, there's this sensation that comes over you. Let yourself feel it. That's one path. Um, the other one is more difficult, but doable. And I wouldn't recommend people do that until they're ready. And the other path is to actually feel their stuff on a very deep level. Not the feelings, like the emotions, but the bodily sensations. Like there's the emotions, right? But underneath the emotions are bodily sensations. Like we're not just sad. We feel empty. Our body feels empty or uh, like a void, like a, a pit in the stomach. There's things in our body that we can experience. They aren't feelings, they're not feelings. they are more of these autonomic shifts happening. So the sooner you can be with those feelings and maintain it and be okay with it, the sooner those feelings can run their course and the natural, because we mammals can naturally climb their ladders. Human beings just kind of suck at it, but we can, it, it's still within us. So as this sympathetic energy comes back within you, if you're going from shutdown into like flight fight, uh, it, you, you'll feel this like power if you can maintain it, if you can actually build the capacity to feel it. If you're not ready for it, it's going to feel like panic or rage or overwhelm and it's going to be disastrous and you're going to start from square one basically. Mm-hmm. So that, that's the other path, which is a lot more difficult. You have to build your capac- capacity to feel safe before you do that. One of the the great things about male survivors forum and chat is that survivors and family members of survivors or supporters of survivors or therapists can go to the forum you can uh, read other people's responses to threads you can share your experience you can get involved in that discussion and that has a great value Oh yes, Be, knowing you're not alone, feeling like you're not alone is it's it's so central to a lot of what I deal with in mental health is is like that's just the constant undercurrent of my clients feeling alone. And having someone to connect with whether it's a therapist, family member, someone you trust, someone you love, or even in a forum. Like, oh, I'm not alone. I I'm not different in my responses other people have been through or are going through. The same thing is there's a lot of value in that and feeling that that lack of aloneness, feeling of support. Yeah, very important. Uh, Richard's asking, is the ladder a therapeutic process? How does one use the ladder in one's own therapy? I'm gonna put up that ladder graphic again. So we address that. It's, it's not a process, it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor for understanding. It's like a roadmap, let's, let's put it that way. It's, you know, in, in therapy, it's a tool I will use. Um, in, in helping to conceptualize and to communicate what's happening or what will happen next. So for my clients who are in a stuck shutdown state, which looks like depression, um, to normalize, hey, when you come out of this, you're gonna feel some irritation, that, that's kind of normal. Or when you as we come out of this, if you can really be with your sensations, when you feel that sympathetic energy come back within you, it's, that's just the next step up the ladder, it's supposed to happen. So it's not a, process it's not exactly it's not a technique it's it's a conceptualization it's a tool it's a roadmap uh, that all mammals can 
if it's you know how mammals recover from going up and down the ladder from trauma or being stuck in a traumatized state so that's yeah that's, that's what i was saying so how does somebody use that on their own I, again like just knowing the next step knowing that if you're in a very empty depressed sad shameful lonely whatever we want to call it whatever your experience is if you're in that kind of shutdown state just know the next step is you're going to have some energy come back in your system and feeling irritated doesn't mean you're failing being angry doesn't mean you're failing we don't want i don't want people to go you know blow up at others and be angry at their family members but just know that the, it's the feelings the energy returning in your system is a neck is a normal part of the process feeling anxious or being worried that's a normal part of the process Connecting with others and being able to hug or make eye contact is normal, but it might be hard to stay there. So it's just, it's a, it's a roadmap of like, here's what's happening. And here's, you know, here's what happened in the moment that you survived the moments. Here's what happened. You dropped down the ladder, but as we come up, this is what's going to happen. And what that looks like person to person is going to be different, but the basic roadmap is, is pretty consistent. Right. Uh, Bruce is asking is polyvagal behind reenacting the abuse, either in one's head or practically, and being stuck in that repetitive loop? Uh, well, it's it's our autonomic nervous system. So it's behind everything. I hate to put that blanket wide, but yeah, I mean, it is, yeah. And what I would say is when you, when you go into, if let's say again, coming out of shutdown and into your flight fight energy, the, the sensations of flight fight might be reminiscent of the thing that you went through. So are you reenacting it on purpose? No, I don't think so. But what's going to happen is as you feel those feelings, those danger feelings, in your mind, it's going to go to the event. So because your mind is like, these feelings feel like this thing that I went through years ago or two weeks ago or whatever it is. So in that sense, yeah, it's very much connected. Even in uh, like when you're asleep, I think what happens, and I've seen this with Peter Levine, I believe he's mentioned this, but even when you're asleep, your autonomic nervous system tries to self-regulate. And you may have these feelings come up, these sensations in your sleep, and your, your mind is going to go to nightmares, potentially, if, if it's too much. So yeah, it has a lot to do with it. Um, I also believe that people do what they're familiar with, um, even if it's painful. So as we feel these sensations come up in our system, we might go to something familiar, which might be drug use, uh, which and maybe the, what the drug use gives us is relief from whatever we're going through. But it also might give a feeling of connection or some people say that the drug is like their relationship or their feeling of love. So, you know, it, is that reenacting? Eh, maybe. I think we go to what is comfortable, predictable, familiar, even if it's painful. So that could be self-perpetuating in and of itself. Peter Levine would say that, yeah, we have a tendency to, he's the creator of somatic experience again, we have a tendency to reenact aspects of what we went through, which end up just kind of reinforcing our stuck traumatic state. So, yeah, I, I think in general, yeah. Well, it's a very brave, Especially like, it's a very sorry, brave question. It's a very brave question it is. To, to, it is. to want to examine why one would reenact the abuse. Uh, I'm just going to take this as you know, either in your head, so in fantasy, or in uh, that you're actually acting out. And yeah, and and so just connecting another bit of of uh, of healing and therapy to this is that uh, it's been said that in the acting out. Uh, the survivor is attempting to uh, try to control the outcome of the situation in an attempt to control it. Uh, is this a clash of these or are they, are they, is everything no. rowing in the same direction? I would say so. It's, I, I like to get as close as I possibly can to, for myself and for my clients to the experience within them, the sensations within them. As psychologists or whatever, we can theorize why we're doing this and that. We can say we're trying to reenact, and that might be true. But really, what it comes down to is like, how do you feel? You know what I mean? When you when you were with that, because I'll meet with uh, students or high school, you know, girls that continually find the wrong relationships. Not just girls, but anybody, but like just the same flavor of relationship over and over again. 
and we can pontificate on how they're reenacting this and that, but really it's like, what's happening within you? Then like, if we can be with that, then the, the, cl- the ladder climbing can start. But if we stay with the stories, the narratives, the explanations, the psychological constructs, if we stay in that, it can build insight, which is nice, but does it help you get closer to the inner sensations? Maybe. I just, I like to get as close as I can to those. So it's, they don't negate each other. But the, if, if we spend a lot of time on the insight stuff, we lose access to, we don't lose access to it, but we kind of delay all the stuff happening within us. And I, that's what I hear from my adult clients. I do therapy at nighttime with adults is that the previous therapist would spend a lot of time on these insight based things, which is nice, but they don't ever get to that next level of like, there's stuff happening within you that exactly. you're, is always going on. You're just not consciously aware of it, but it's always there. So we can put together pieces all day long and build insight, but ultimately like what's happening within you. Yeah. Again, that's, that's the thing that to me was, was so groundbreaking in my recovery journey is to finally address a piece that is body specific and explained why I had so much tension in my body. Yeah. Well, and hopefully uh, not just for you, but for anybody, not just to, oh, I get it now, but also to feel it. So when I do therapy, we, it's not just knowing it. It's like, as long as the client's, I'm not going to push the client farther than they're willing to go. But but um, as they're ready to, and I check in with them, like, hey, there's something happening within you. Do you want to check in with it? Do you want to be with it for a moment, just as much as you're ready to? And they'll say like, yes or no. So it's not just knowing that, hey, there's something happening within me, but like, what's it like? What is it actually like to be me in my chair in this moment? Like I feel this pit in my stomach and it's like, well, let's, let's stay with that for a moment. Like, what does that feel like? What, explain it to me. What, um, what textures, what does it feel like? What colors are there? What, sometimes an image will pop into someone's mind. Like, I feel like, I feel this emptiness or I feel this aloneness. And the image that comes to their mind might be I'm stuck in a basement and I hear a drop of water. This was a client actually told me, I hear some water dropping and there's just one light bulb and it's very specific one light bulb on above me. So it's like, can you go into those images and explain what it's like to be in the image? And then it's like, now we're really experiencing what it is to be like, to be us in that moment and sharing it with somebody else who is not judging you, not shaming you and just being with you. And those sensations will do the thing. So not just knowing it, but like feeling it is what I'm trying to say. Right, right. So um, Jay is asking, are you familiar with the safe and sound protocol? Do you have thoughts on this type of sound therapy? And I imagine they're not talking about the uh, Capital City song, Safe and Sound. <laughs> which I, I, it was just Probably amazing not. tune. I love that tune. <laughs> great, great melody. Jay is a great name also. That's my middle name. And my son's name is Jay as well. It's a great name. I have some familiarity with it. And it seems legit to me. It's not about hacking the vagus nerve. It actually comes from Dr. Porges. What it does is, as best I understand it, is it actually helps. And it was built for people with autism and has shown to be, from what I understand, really effective. And now it's kind of bleeding out into other uh, therapeutic uh, populations. But the idea is that you're stimulating the inner eardrums to like open and close. And as we as we do things like that, or like slowing down our breathing, that can trigger our safety state to come on. So, so if, if, like if people like are breathing deeply or shallow into their chest or into their shoulders, that's probably more flight by energy. But if you can slow your exhale, yeah, if you can slow your breath on the way out, that actually activates the parasympathetic system, which is the safe and social system. And it, so you, you can actually activate, if you can mindfully do so, and then extend how long you're um, activating that system, it just can help you get to a baseline, can help you to relieve some of that flight by energy, it can help. So I believe with Safe and Sound Protocol, it's actually activating some inner eardrum stuff, which is activating the um, safety state, but it's not just that, because there's there's also co-regulation there, the parents are in the room, there's a therapist in the room, so there's lots of co-regulation happening, plus the the music. The music is, is supposed to be very prosodic, which means like lots of range of up and down uh, voice and whatnot, and not like hip hop or heavy metal or the screaming and yelling. So that when you have vocal prosody, something like that can actually help you activate your own safe and social state. So being around safe people, that, that's kind of the idea is, is activating your safe and social state through prosody, through that musicality of voice. 
you, know, you, mentioned, it you mentioned prosody and that's a word I had first heard through your podcast um, just switching the the focus here for a moment to being a parent mm. is you know when I'm struggling with being in a, down the ladder and I'm needing to parent that the prosody in my voice mm -hmm. um, is affecting my children. Yeah. And I can't rewrite the history, but I just feel like I just wasn't a good parent sometimes. Well, we, we also can't expect perfection. It's okay to make mistakes. And not having vocal prosody doesn't mean you're making a mistake. Being in a defensive state does not mean you're making a mistake. We just don't want it to be out of control. You know, I, I'll, I'll lower my voice to my kids and say, like, no, like, they, they know when I'm serious. But that's a heck of a lot different than losing control and swearing or yelling or, like, just shaming them. Like, that's a heck of a lot different. But they'll know, like, no, it's time to go to bed. Like, my voice drops. But I'm still okay. I'm still in my safety state. I can still roll with the punches. But it's just like, no, it's time for bed. So it, that's not bad. Losing access to vocal prosody is not bad as long as you're safe enough to still, you know, ma you know, manage yourself, not just self-control, but like actually to self-regulate. And your, your kids will notice that they'll see once you've lost control, it's different. Like once you're truly in a defensive state, they'll pick up on that in a much different way. Um, but we have the five minute mark. I know there's a lot of ground we still wanted to cover as far as our agenda is concerned. We have a few more questions, yeah. but we have to bring this to a um, section on uh, the bagel break and building safety anchors. The bagel break is the influence of your safe and social state on your heartbeat. And what that means is if your safe and social pathways, those biological pathways, if they're active and strong enough, it'll keep your heartbeat at a calmer pace. And if that's true, then as that defensive energy surfaces or resurfaces, or as the freeze energy, the stuck trauma stuff, if that starts to come out, then your vagal break will keep your heartbeat at a calmer pace. So it won't feel like rage and overwhelm and panic. It'll feel the experience is a lot different. And so having the vagal break act strong is a really good thing. And the way you do that is by activating your safety state and being in there as much as you can. You know, we have an hour. We expected this to be um, an introduction and it is, uh, but you can't yeah, cover, too. you can't cover everything in an hour. So, um, you know, just to, to point people to how they can help themselves from here and to the future, Justin, you've given us some traction in the issue, you know, let's bring it on home to us for us, Justin. Um, what, what, what should we do next, survivors who are interested? I would really encourage people to, I think that having the factual knowledge is a really good idea. So luckily I have a podcast around, around this stuff. If you go, if you do go to the Stuck Not Broken podcast and episode 101 through 109 are a really deep exploration of these ideas. I, I don't think it's too much. But if, like, if you really want to get a deeper understanding of what I'm talking about, listen to those. Because once you have that, like, a, that larger new paradigm for understanding yourself, then you, well, you apply it to yourself. And that's going to help you build a new narrative of who you are and why you are the way you are. So having the factual knowledge and then applying it to the self can just help build a, nor, a more normalizing, validating uh, narrative of who you are. The other thing I would do after that is to... You, you mentioned safety anchors. Identify what brings you to safety. Like, I mean, I, I do not encourage people to start delving into the pain. I would really encourage people to identify what brings them to safety and do as much of that as mindfully as you can. I didn't realize that uh, swimming was one of my safety anchors until, oh, yeah. uh, until your podcast forced me to think through it. Why do I like this? And when I got to that point, yeah. I, I figured it out. It's like, I like the feel of the water around me. I, I like feeling yeah. going through the water. It's not just the exercise. It's also the quiet, the mental quiet of, of, of being in a pool. I mean, you're, you're a bit sensory deprived. Uh, yeah, I like that too. I, I like going underwater and just like existing within the dampened uh, stimuli. Because 
all the traffic noise that I hear, all my kids screaming <laughs> or yeah, whatever. Not, and not it's, to mention, not to mention uh, breathing. Hmm. And what do you mean? The, the, well, the, the the regular breathing, the the regulated breathing, which is hard for me, which I think is hard for survivors mm. to actually breathe deep from the from the bottom of your lungs and not gotcha. up high in the chest. Yeah, yeah, but if you can breathe in your belly and then extend the exhale, you're activating your safety state, and just you, you can start to build some familiarity with what that might feel like. You know, that's a good place to start too. We're bearing down on the final minute. So I'm just going to turn it over to you, Justin, to see what message you would like to share to survivors. I think the first one that consistently pops in my mind is that you're, you're normal. Uh, all of us are, you know, there's, there's things that we go through in life or events that we don't have, attachments that we don't have. And it leaves us potentially in a stuck defensive state. And that's not because we're defective. It's we're just normal. And we're stuck, not broken, like my podcast says. Yeah, it, this is an issue. There's not an issue of being defective or broken or or anything like that. It's it's um, it, it's to me, it's like an expected outcome of how we may have been raised, or even not just how we were raised, but things we survive even as adults. This is not abnormal, in, in my opinion. The stuff we went through is abnormal, but the state that we're stuck in is not exactly abnormal. I wouldn't say that. Well, I'm so thankful for your willingness to do this tonight with us, Justin. I'm happy to. I'm, I'm honored because I, I know how much this all this means to you and everybody else here. So having me be a part of it, I'm honored. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of this. Justin, Nathan, attendees, thank you very much and have a great evening. Again, this has been a webinar that I did for malesurvivor.org. If you found this uh, beneficial, Reach out to them and say how incredible they're doing. Um, check out their resources. Check out their forum, uh, mailsurvivor.org. Otherwise, thank you so much for listening. I hope you've learned something new to help you climb your own polyvagal ladder. Do me a favor and share this episode with someone that you think might benefit. And make sure you're following or subscribed on whatever podcast platform you listen to so you can get updated immediately with every week's new episode. Bye. This podcast is not therapy, not intended to be therapy or be a replacement for therapy. Nothing in this creates or indicates a therapeutic relationship. Please consult with your therapist or seek for one in your area if you're experiencing mental health symptoms. Nothing in this podcast should be construed to be specific life advice. It's for educational and entertainment purposes only. More resources are available in the description of this episode and in the footer of justinlmft.com.